here, okay? Okay. <clears throat> so, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in our first session for July for our weekly research bites that is taking the place this year of the annual Inky Conference. Unfortunately, due to COVID, of course, we're having to do all of this virtually, but it has meant that we've had the opportunity to have some really great conversations. So we're very thankful for everyone who's participated, both via being a panelist or, or a presenter, and as well for those people who have been submitting their questions or have been part of the conversations. So just a couple of housekeeping things. Please put yourselves on mute. I will be muting everyone uh, on our end as well, but just to make sure that nothing actually bleeds in with technology, you never know. Uh, from week to week, we have had different struggles, and so um, we just want to make sure that we have a nice, clean sound for when I actually do the recording and put it up for those people who weren't capable of joining us during the actual session. This week, uh, my friend Robin, who is a research scientist with the Public Health Agency of Canada in the Zoonotic Diseases and Special Pathogens section of the Mic National Micro Lab in Winnipeg, is going to be focusing on the diagnostic surveillance and basic and applied um, research with regards to tick identification. And so he's a specialist with a wide variety of zoonotic disease vectors, and that includes ticks, mosquitoes, and all kinds of different rodent-borne zoonoses. And so his research has been used to validate all kinds of risk models and to populate risk maps for exposure to all kinds of different vector-borne pathogens in Canada. And so we were lucky to have him actually present earlier during our sessions on one of the most interesting new ticks that we are hoping doesn't actually make it into Canada, but is in North America, the Asian longhorn tick. And this time around, he's just going to give an overall view of how to best identify the ones that uh, you might find on either yourselves or your furry friends this summer. So because this particular presentation is actually replacing the workshop that Robin was going to do as part of the conference, it's actually going to be a longer talk. So it'll be 25 to 30 minutes. If you do have uh, burning questions from what he said, feel free to send those to me in the chat. and. I will then uh, give those to Robin to make sure that he answers those. You also can send them to me and he will answer a little bit more thoroughly and I can send those out as an email later on. This time around though, we aren't going to have the same 10 to 15 minute conversation Q&A that, that we normally do. Anyway, Robin, it is all over to you. Well, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Jasmine. It's great to be here. And again, this replaces my talk. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, a co-presenter, uh, Dr. Katie Clow from the University of Guelph. She provided quite a few of the slides and the, and the uh, taxonomic key that we're going to be using today when we walk through these tick identification slides. So I just wanted to make sure that Katie got her, her due. Um, lots of material to cover, so I'm going to get right to it. Now, for this particular crowd here, I don't have to tell you why ticks are important. From you know, starting with the yuck factor, I mean, they cause psychological impacts, and the number of disorders that are associated with tick bites. The most important one, from our perspective, is of course the transmission of pathogens. And fortunately, although you see a laundry list of diseases that are uh, transmitted um, by ticks in Canada, the only ones that are really emerging and um, expanding their range and are actually increasing in frequency are the ones that are transmitted by the black-legged tick, Exoides scapularis here. So Lyme disease, Anaplasma, Babesia, they're, they're uh, common. But these 
diseases have other vectors, so you'd like to be able to identify these. There are a few other uh, tick-borne diseases transmitted by cook eye and, and exoides marksi. So they're only a relatively small number of species that are involved in, in disease transmission in Canada. And again, I think it's important to remember we identify ticks and tick bites to provide an assessment of risk from those tick bites. And one of the main components of that risk is what species of tick is biting the person. So this is central to understanding what a exposure to ticks means in terms of risk to their health, along with level of engorgement and infection status. So actually, if you know the species of the tick and you know its level of engorgement, you can give some pretty good advice to the person about what the next steps are in terms of the uh, the risk that they've been exposed to, and then what might what what the next steps might be in terms of uh, seeking treatment for that exposure. Fortunately, in Canada, we don't have a huge number of ticks. There's only about 40 different species that we see on uh, with regularity in Canada of the 900 species on a global basis. So our our fauna is quite sparse. We have two families, the, the hard ticks, uh, exoididae, and the soft ticks, sargassidae. We're not going to deal with the soft ticks today. They're really uh, quite limited in their distribution, BC and Alberta. They're really not, they're nest associates, so you very rarely see them in the environment. So we'll focus in on the hard ticks. And again, we've got 24 species of exoides spe uh, ticks. So those ones, we'll be looking at the features for those. We have three dermacenter species, which we'll see in a moment. Two Haemophysalis uh, species, uh, Cordalis and Leporus palustris, one species of Ryptocephalus uh, sanguineus, the brown dog tick, and a couple of sort of imported amblyoma species. Now, despite the fact that there's those 30 some hard ticks, really we're lucky that there's only a small number, about nine species that we would encounter frequently in the environment, either on ourselves or on companion animals, and they're listed here. And again, even from a, a human standpoint, if we want to get uh, a little more human-centric, there are really only about six species that bite people with any degree of frequency in Canada. That's the, And they look like this. So the, the black-legged tick looks almost identical to the western black-legged tick, so there's two there. The ground dog tick this is an adult. The American dog tick and the Rocky Mountain wood tick look very similar. And then there's the occasional bite that we get from Lone Star ticks. So the, the number of species we're exposed to is relatively small. So it's relatively easy to, to look at the fauna and be able to identify them. So to identify ticks, you really do need uh, the proper equipment here. And the first essential piece of equipment is the stereo microscope. I guess you could identify ticks to stage or, or uh, maybe tell some of them with a hand lens or by eye, but really to get into the, to the nymphs and uh, adults with detail, you need a stereoscope, but nothing too fancy, 40 to 100 times magnification, but you definitely need an excellent light source. I cannot overemphasize the, the structures that we'll be looking for are often quite tiny and obscured, so you need good lighting and perhaps even a second light source, not just a single source, but multiple sources. You need some tools to manipulate the ticks, so fine forceps. I find a paintbrush is excellent for moving uh, immature stages, larvae or nymphs around. And again, this is a trick I learned um, many years ago at a tick identification course in Ohio, using fun tack or plasticine or molding clay as a medium to stick the ticks in so you can look at them at all kinds of weird angles is very helpful. Of course, you also need uh, a taxonomic key and we'll, we'll talk about those keys in a moment. Because you're looking at the morphological structures of these ticks, there are some that are very important and that will allow you to identify them. And I'm going to go through them in detail now. And uh, the first thing that you'll you'll notice, and, and you're going to learn how to tell the difference between adult ticks uh, at this moment, is female ticks have a scutum. It's a structure that covers the anterior portion of their idiosome or body here. And this part does not expand when they engorge, just the, this portion of the body does. So when you see a tick and it doesn't have an obvious demarcation at the front, that's a female. You could also see that it has a, a genital aperture here. The males, their sputum covers the entire dorsum of the back. So 
you don't see that demarcation. So right away you can tell a male from a female based on scutum covering entire dorsum, scutum restricted to the anterior portion of the dorsum. Um, the other features that are often, yeah, you can tell a, a female, is they have this porosal area. And the sort of the, the, the bubbles here and the structures themselves and the, the, the shape of that is important. This is an area where eggs are placed there and uh, they're coated with a waterproofing structure. So obviously females are the only ones that lay eggs, so they're the only stage that has this porosal area. Nymphs would not have that and of course males wouldn't. There's a structure called cornuae. They're present at the, on the dorsal surface of this structure which is called the capitulum or basis capitulum. The whole head is called the capitulum, and where the mouth parts are attached is called the basis capitulum, or the base for the head. Uh, so the structure of the cornea are important here in terms of their whether they're present or absent and their, and their overall shape. What's also important is this hypostome. The hypostome is that structure that penetrates into the skin. It has the teeth on there and the denticles on there, and again, the, 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 the number of teeth, the shape of the teeth, whether they're the same, is very important taxonomically. And again, obviously, though, really only good for specimens that are collected in the field that are unfed. Because, of course, the hypostome is, if their ticks have come from a host, the hypostome is often broken when the tick is removed from the host. So it, it's, it's not the greatest feature to look for, and many keys will use the, the, the teeth or the dentition patterns as an identification source, but often even the entire head might be missing from a specimen. The palps are diagnostic as well, the shape and, and overall length and which, whether they have flanges or not are also important uh, structures to look at. If you look at the flip side of those male and female tick, uh, another structure that's very uh, interesting and, and diagnostic is uh, called auriculae. And again, whether they're present, their overall shape is important in identification. And even in this tick, this is the same tick here, the auriculae are different between the sexes. The, the leg segments are, only the first two are really diagnostic. The first one is called the coxy, and often the, the, it is, has or a series of spurs on the in, inner surface or the exterior surface are these spurs, and they are diagnostic as well. And again, you can see here uh, the genital aperture. Believe it or not, a male obviously has a, a heat transfer sperm to the female, so he has a genital aperture, but it's often much more uh, less pronounced than, than in the, uh, the female. And again, the palps, their overall structure and size are important. And the other thing is the sphericals. These are the breathing apparatus. Uh, adults and nymphs have these, so they're diagnostic as well. Their shape and what, are their, what the cells look like inside of them are important as well. And on the male ticks here, you see that there are a number of plates that are missing from the female here. This is the median plate here in the middle here, and the anal plate goes around the anus. Uh, that's also an important diagnostic feature, these plates as well as that groove that's present uh, around the anus, and you'll see in a moment why that's important. Don't forget the different stages. Uh, you should be able to tell them apart quite easily based on uh, a couple of features. Larvae are the, the stage that comes out of the egg, and clearly the larvae are um, the first stage. They only have six legs. They don't have sphericals, and again, if you encounter them in the field, many little bugs, beetles, aphids look like ticks, but what I do is a, a, a simple squish test. You take the larvae, what you think is a larval tick between your finger and thumb, and you give it a little grinding motion. A tick will be happy and all excited that you're giving them a back rub. A, uh, insect will be destroyed by that, so it's easy to tell them tell that you're dealing with a tick and not something else using that method. Nymphs are bigger than um, larvae. They have eight legs, but they lack a genital aperture. They're not mature yet, so they just look like a, a miniature female. Uh, and then, of course, the females have the scutum covering the the dors or the anterior surface, and they're support male with no scutum covering the entire dorsum. Males cannot engorge because that, that structure is covering their entire uh, back. If they tried to engorge, they would explode. Don't forget, you're also faced with the challenge of 
when the ticks are unfed, oh, they're pretty easy to identify. But when you get into the engorged status of these ticks, when they're at different levels of engorgement, that makes it a little bit more challenging to see some of these features that we'll be talking about. And again, when you go to identify ticks, this is back to, you know, first year biology, every single tick, every single, you know, uh, macrofauna animal, plants and the like, are identified through the use of dichotomous keys. So it's essentially it's a, a roadmap here where you look at a series of characters and then based on the description of what it is, you move through the key to identify the particular uh, specimen in, in question. I'm not going to go through these line by line, but when you go to identify ticks yourself, some of them will be obvious and you'll be able to do it by ID, by eye, like the dermacenter. They're the only ornate tick that have colorations, dark brown. Those are dead easy without a key, but you'll still need a key to get to differentiate between the species. So let's just go through some examples here. And again, when you want to identify the tick to the genus, well, exoides are the most common tick. So we want to eliminate or include them as a, a tick of a suspect tick. And again, these are dead easy to get to genus because they have this anal groove anterior to the anus. So it goes up here. You just see that anal groove going around the anus here. And again, all the other uh, hard ticks in Canada lack that anal groove they have. So that's the exoides species. What you have with these, all the other ones, the hemophysalis, the dermacenter, you have this, what looks like a wine glass worth of uh, around here. It doesn't go uh, anterior to the anus. So just looking at the anal groove, you can tell uh, which genus you're looking at. Is it exoides? It'll go anterior. If it's not, then it's one of the other species. And the way you identify the other species would be based on Haemophysalis. So how do you tell this species? Well, it's the only one that's wearing a hat here. It's not actually wearing a hat. The palps on this particular guy are flanged. The first palpal segment is flanged, so it has that appearance of being uh, rectangular. This is the only tick in Canada that has that hexagonal shaped capitulum, their base is capitulum. So this one looks to me like a stormtrooper. It's got the funny little shape. None of the other ticks have this shape of a basis capitulum. So that's a almost a pathognomonic uh, feature that you could use to identify them. If you get ticks with the basis capitulum that is square, like these guys here, or sort of rounded, you can tell when they have short mouth, broad mouth parts, or, or palps, that that's a dermacenter uh, species. And then when you got these big boys, this is uh, the amblyoma species, they have serious mouth parts. This is uh, at least a half an inch long, so they have square capitulum, but very long mouth parts. So let's just go through a few examples to get you sort of oriented. And I'll just, I'm just going to give you the, the cheater's version of what I look at when I look at these. But don't forget, I, I mean, I've been looking at ticks for over 30 years. I know all the features off by, off by heart by just eyeballing them. When you go to do it, you're going to have to walk them through a, a dichotomous key like this and follow the instructions in the key to get to the right spot. So adult males, of the, and again, the only ones you're likely to see uh, out in the environment, males are usually more associated with the hosts. And if you're just out in the environment, you're necessarily, and they seem in many cases not to be uh, present at all, although they uh, they must be. So black-legged tick males are one that many people would encounter, and they have this very distinct um, chocolatey brown color. Of course, they're male because the scutum covers the entire dorsum. When you want to differentiate them, these guys are like... Uh, they need dental work. Their teeth are horrible. The dentitions here, it's different sizes, and the, the crenations on their hypostome are quite dramatic. So they look like they got bad teeth. They have this very elongated, oops, excuse me, elongated uh, internal spur. And on this median um, plate here, they get large punctations present on, the, on that median plate. Now, the only other tick that you might see that looks like this, is, and it's identical looking, is Exodes pacificus males. And you can see I've written there, in this case, the spiracular plate on the black-legged tick is elongated, whereas on 
the western black-legged tick, it's oval. And there'll be small punctations on the median plate. I don't like those features of large versus small because if you've never seen them, it's hard to tell which is which, but you'll get used to it after a while. And males are really super rare of any of the exoidy species. I can tell you, in 30 years, I've never seen a male exoides cooki. I've never seen a male exoides uh, angustus. I've never seen a male uh, murus. They're out there, obviously. They're, they, these are, <clears throat> they are, they need to have sex in order to lay fertile eggs, but they're just super rare. Here's an excellent little exoides king. I put this on for Jasmine's benefit here. These were collected from a uh, ground dog uh, burrow in Grasslands National Park. It looks very superficially similar to that, but you get these very long, elongated corneae. But again, males are super rare, and uh, like a good husband, good males are hard to find. Okay, let's get to the ones that we're going to encounter much more frequently, and that's the females. Of course, you find females because they engorge. Uh, they're, they're taking a full blood meal in order to lay eggs, so they're much more likely to, to be encountered and then to be found because they attach and feed for so long. And the first one, and it's my favorite tick of all time here, is the black-legged tick, Exoides scapularis. And the diagnostic features for me, first I go and I look, okay, do I see an anal groove anterior to the anus? Absolutely. I look at the shape of the scutum here. This is uh, rounded or nearly circular. Then I flip it over and I go, what do the auriculae look like? Well, they're, they're just little bumps, but it's got this elongated internal spur. And the corneae are small but distinct. No other tick as an adult female looks like this in Canada. The only other one Again, when you look at them, you collect some Pacificus, you look at them, they look identical to this, except the scutum is a different, slightly different shape. It's more oval. Again, not a term I like, rounded versus oval. But the cornea are absent on Western black-legged ticks, present on black-legged ticks. So great if, you, if the tick's head is still attached, then you're good to go. Just look for the cornea. If the head is gone, then you're going to have to base this on based that differentiation on that. These are horrible colors. Color is also a bad thing to use. When uh, black-legged ticks are unfed females, they look like this beautiful uh, color. They've come out in the fall, so I think they have this say, the sort of uh, Halloween orange or chimney red color to their the pistosomas, this beautiful red color. But color changes as they engorge with blood, you can see. So color is generally a poor um, identifier, again, because you're seeing the blood meal being digested and accumulated in these ticks, so you can't really use color as an identifier. My other second most favorite tick is this groundhog tick. And again, this thing, that what, what I look at right away, of course, anal groove, anterior to the anus, that's an exoides. These shoulders on the scutum, dead giveaway, plus the fact they have this posterior process on palpal segment one that points out no other tick has this. They have an elongated internal spur, but again, it's, I look at that angular scutum and it's a dead giveaway. Relatively short palps, but this angular scutum, and even in an engorged one, look at those shoulders there. You can see quite readily those shoulders. Scapularis would be more rounded here. Here's an, another really cool tick that we encounter occasionally on dogs and people in the late summer and early fall. It's Exodes mirus most tick, all stages found on mice, and it's got this really cool uh, elongated, uh, when I see this, again, I go to the anal groove, yes, yeah, Exodes, I see that elongated tear-shaped scutum, and I see these very prominent auriculae. None of the other species had really prominent auriculae. These point straight back and look very much like a nymphal scapularis, but it's you look for the genital aperture, you know it's a, a female. And the other thing that's a diagnostic to me is these, the shape of these, uh, the internal and external spurs. They're almost sub-equal. Sub so I see this tick, I see the elongated scutum, I see these interesting little auriculae and these bifurcated uh, internal and external spurs, and boom, that's a bow stick. 
if you're in the field and you find a mouse like this and there's a huge adult tick on it, guess what? That's going to be a murus because this is the only adult, or the only exoides tick that feeds on rodents as an adult. So, very large tick here. Probably this mouse would eventually eat that tick, so don't feel too sorry for that uh, little rodent there. Mark's eye is another dead easy uh, tick to identify. This is a squirrel tick. Very important and occasionally will bite people and, and mostly found in, in parts of eastern Canada. But this tick has this sort of waist. I look at this. The other one had shoulders. This has a skinny waist. The sputum forms that sort of little scalloping or, or waist-like appearance. But the, in addition to that, this guy almost entirely lacks spurs. It doesn't have It's just maybe one little external spur and all of the other uh, coxae lack spurs. So this is a dead easy one to identify. You look for that funky little waist on the uh, sputum and then the absence of spurs is a dead giveaway. When they're, in go when they're collected, they're not always that color, but again, here's one that I've collected um, or had submitted to us. And you can see the, the waist-like appearance, and it's much darker in appearance than, than the ones that I've illustrated there. The last exoides you want to look at here is this, uh, the uh, very wide distribution for Angustus, uh, female uh, or ticks in general. And these guys have the somewhat uh, elongated but still oval uh, sputum. To me, the, the, the basis capitulum has a unique shape. It's much more rectangular. And then they've got the same sub-equal uh, coxae one uh, as we saw with mirrors. But again, the shape of that, first of all, the elongated uh, sputum, and then the shape of the head is, is what gives it away as, a, as an Angustus. Now, the hemophysalis are dead easy to identify as well. As I mentioned, they're the ones wearing a hat here. The palps are flayed out. You may encounter uh, Leporus perustris in Canada. You may encounter Cordellus. Uh, looks very similar to this. Uh, and you may even come across some atypical ones, the Asian longhorn tick, which I talked about last time. If you get any of those, obviously, like we'd like to have a, exa uh, examine those in detail. But the features that identify or separate them here, again, is this. This is the uh, palpal segment three on long and cornice. This is supposed to be the long palps here. The, uh, on the rabbit tick, they're much shorter. These have these, uh, uh, these ventral spurs on the basis capitulum here where they're absent on that guy. So pretty subtle differences between them. And again, but if you find some that, that you are challenged with, you let us know. But overall, that shape of the, of the palps is a dead giveaway. Here's the other really easy one to do, the Stormtrooper uh, uh, brown dog tick. Again, the only feature you really need to look at is the, is the, uh, the shape of that basis capitulum. No other tick in Canada has a basis capitulum that shape. Can be challenging, though, when they get engorged. They tend to, to, to bloat up, and it's harder to see the basis capitulum, but they are overall relatively easy to identify. And then the, the second last group here is the derma center, and I find that they are easy to identify because they're the only genus of ticks in Canada that are ornate. So they have this coloration. The coloration is restricted to the sputum in the female and covers the entire dorsum of the male. They all more or less look the same as this. The coloration patterns are somewhat variable, but they look like you can't differentiate. You can say dermacenter based on the overall appearance, the short, uh, the square basis capitulum, the short mouth parts, this ornate uh, ability. But what you identify them on the basis of, though, to tell the species apart is the number of goblet cells in the spherical. And I have a picture of that to show you. But when you get these, you can say, oh, that's a dermacenter. You have to be able to look at the spherical, be able to tell what species it is. And don't forget, when these engorge, the sputum stays the same size. So the or inor inornate nature or the ornate nature of the of the sputum is still captured in an engorged specimen. It's the Rocky Mountain wood tick, very similar, but again, you go to those goblet cells and you can see this one's a medium sized goblet cell. American dog ticks had small cells. And there's our the last of the dermacenter. Here's the big uh, the big ugly uh 
moose dick here. These seem like they're they're dermacenter on steroids. Like they have, they just seem thicker and they look very similar. The patterns are very similar, but to me, I can always spot these, and I don't know what it is. Uh, there's something about them that's different. They they definitely superficially look like the other two, but the goblet cells are much larger in the spherical, and the spherical is typically more rounded in the in this species than the other two. So really, the way to tell, I mean, you look at the basis capitulum, rectangular, short palps, ornate, ascutum, it's a dermacenter. How you tell apart? Lots of large gob or large goblet cells, moose dick, intermediate sized goblet cells, uh, Rocky Mountain wood dick, many many tiny goblet cells, dermacenter variabilis. Can you can base it somewhat on distribution too? Uh, American dog ticks are more eastern in their distribution compared to uh, dermacenter andersoni, which is Saskatchewan westward, but. These are relatively simple characters you can look at and identify easily. The last genus that we're going to look at in the adults is, of course, uh, the amblyoma. And these guys, I mean, to me, what sticks out again is this, the, the basis capitulum and these honk and big palps here with the big pointy uh, hypostome on them. Lone star tick adult females are dead easy. They got the, the lone star ornate uh, nature of the uh, coloration pattern. The male, and in either sex, so the, the, the differentiating factor between this and amblyoma uh, maculatum, which we also occasionally see, is the relative size of the, uh, the, the coxae or the spurs. The internal spur here is half the length of the external one. That versus maculatum. And right away you see with this one, okay, the coloration pattern on the females is different somewhat different on the male, but again, the, the key feature here is they have almost no internal spur, just this honking big external spur. And both sexes have these humongous, uh, in the males, humongous internal spur on the fourth coxy, uh, which I think is kind of cool. So what about larvae and nymphs? I mean, really, these are hard to identify because they're so small. And because they're so small, they're invariably damaged. I mean, most people's forceps are bigger than the tick that they're going to try to remove with it, so that they're often damaged. But we already talked about how you identify them to stage, and I think you can easily identify nymphs with a good dissecting scope and a decent light source. Larvae, with some experience, you can identify them, uh, but really they should be cleared and mounted on slides to to serve as a collection for you to identify them. Of course, any tick can be ground up, or legs can be removed, and they can be ground up and DNA extracted, and you can run PCR and, and sequencing to determine the species when needed. Obviously, you wouldn't want to use mixed pools here, but of course, molecular identification is, a, is uh, always a fallback if you run into issues. And we do that occasionally here at NML because we get specimens from Africa or so some Canadian with a history of travel, or we used to with Canadians with a history of travel. So we don't know every species, so we often use molecular as well. The two species I want to show you today are just the ones you might encounter in Canada, and that's this is the most common nymph that would attack anyone in Canada. This is a beautiful image I got from a submitter of, and again, it's that scutum of the tick that's very distinct, very similar to the adult, and on the underside, it's these auriculae are very distinct. They point straight back, and that's different from Exoides mirus. They're a bit angled. And you can see this is a sinuous uh, dorsal surface of the capitulum. And they have the one internal spur. Pacificus looks somewhat like this, but this portion here is straight and not sinuous. And Muris, again, is a little bit similar to this, but the shape of the, of the auricula, the direction of the auricula are a bit different. And here's my favorite little guy here. This is, again, you can see that, boy, you can see the shoulders on this. The shoulder, like scutum, is still present in this guy. And even in, even in here, you can see that little process um, on the, I can't really get my pointer in there. Uh, there's that process that's pointing down. Oops, I went too far. Uh, so the thing that's the feature here is, again, the second process on uh, palpal segment one. Uh, that it shows up quite nicely on this image, 
and the shape of that sputum. That's what really gives away the groundhog tick. So again, you need a good taxonomic key to, to work through these specimens. So again, the one that I would recommend is one I'm a co-author on. It's, and because I'm Scottish, it's the best one ever because it's free. So you just Google linguistics and you'll see this handbook to the ticks of Canada and has keys to all of the instars, including the soft ticks for those who are super keen. To keep in your repertoire, it would be good to also have this older key by Kierenson uh, Litwick on the adult stages uh, east of the Mississippi River. And then these are two. This is an older one from 1970. I think you could still get this from uh, the American Society of Entomology. It's an excellent resource because it has uh, the scanning EM images, as does this one. But of every adult exoides, males and females, this is the nymphal stages. So these are great resources for people who want uh, to learn more. So uh, at that point, I guess I'm through the conversation and I've used up my entire 30 minutes. So what do you want to do, Jasmine? <laughs> well, thank you, Robin. That was great and as always somehow after conversations about ticks with you my skin is now crawling thank you right i think it's not the ticks okay it's just me <laughs> right well unfortunately so it is 10:35 my time so 12:35 ottawa time so if people need to leave they are um most welcome if anybody does have some very quick questions, we potentially can take those. Um, there is the request, I don't know if you have right close on your desktop, Robin, uh, an Asian longhorned tick picture. So if you, if you have a picture where you could actually compare all of them really quickly, if not, uh, what we can do is we can pull that together and I can send that out. Yeah, there, there's an excellent that resource, that key that I mentioned in that slide, has yep. scanning EM images that show all of the, the larvae, the nymphs, and the adult male and female of each of those four, uh, the, I guess it's the four species you find in the U.S., three in Canada, side by each, and that's a great resource. So if people want to just go look at that image, those are those are the best that are, are occurring. Okay, and I will, when I send the next Inky email out, I will include the link for that uh, resource. And then, Robin, um, what we've I know we've discussed climate change quite a bit. What do you feel the current uh, trends with climate change are doing on the habitat of ticks within Canada? We know that the ranges are expanding somewhat, but are they expanding more in certain areas? And has there been enough of an a overall survey, which was what we were trying to sort of build earlier mm -hmm. in the fall, to actually be able to comment on that? Well, I think, that, I mean, we definitely see, I mean, if you look at historically, um, well, fortunately, you know, some jurisdictions have always been doing some level of, of surveillance for ticks. For example, the Department of Entomology here at the University of Manitoba, uh, through a, you know, for decades, has been providing extension services to, to, to Manitobans who could submit ticks and, and identify them. So we've always had, a, uh, through that, that sort of informal surveillance, an indication of where the ticks were found. Uh, in Manitoba, and it's absolutely uh, been demonstrated through more passive tick surveillance that the ticks in Manitoba expanded into areas where they weren't before. Work of Neil Chilton and his group at the University of uh, at the University of Saskatchewan has also looked, and they've been out in the field to, to look at the changing uh, range of both the American dog tick as well as the Rocky Mountain wood tick. And again, they've demonstrated that there's been significant range expansions in those in those species. And, and again, it's it, it's useful that we we have enough interested people with some funding to be able to continue to monitor the ticks to be able to tell that change is really occurring in them. Of course, black-legged ticks get a lot of press and we're very interested in them and, and do a lot of work in terms of looking at where they're going to, so that the ones that are frequently bite people that, that we encounter 
we've got good data sets and good information on those. The, the lesser known species of ticks, because they're not of public health importance or veterinarian uh, health importance, we know much less about. So right. the ones we know that are out there, the common ones we know quite a bit about, and we definitely can say that across the board, many of their ranges are expanding, but there's, there's, that's only a subset of the total, and we know very little about the others. Right, okay. And so then with all of the concern around African swine fever right now, do we know whether or not the soft tick found in southwestern BC, so the Ornithodorus hermsii? Hermsii, yeah, yeah it's, I mean, yeah. it's present there, but, yeah. you know, it's funny, you know, um, well, it's not funny, funny to he, it's funny in general that we have a good surveillance system in place, to, but it looks indirectly for exposure to these ticks through the acquisition of relapsing fever. So we know that there's probably, you know, through BC CDC, who do surveillance for that or testing for that particular pathogen, they see an ad, you know, one or two cases of that uh, per year or less frequently. So they know that because that is transmitted by these ticks, they know that that tick must be present there, but it is it is a very cryptic species. I mean, all of these species that, you know, that, that I've shown you today, I could tell you, Jasmine, you want to collect some of these, go to, you know, go to uh, Pemina Valley Provincial Park, you'll collect species X, Y, and Z. I cannot, with any degree of certainty, tell you where to go in BC to collect uh, Ornithotus hermsii ticks. We know they're present there, but because they're so understudied, nobody even knows where where to look. But I mean, I'm sure if you did a, a fulsome survey of, you know, uh, log cabins in the Okanagan, you'd probably stumble across some. Right, and and the issue with soft ticks, obviously, is they're so much harder to actually collect. Oh, absolutely. They are, you know, they're nest associates. They're, they're not out in the environment. You can't drag for them. Really, it is, I mean, you get cues or hints from, you know, things like, okay, this is a confirmed case of um, relapsing fever associated with visiting this cabin, you know, north of Peachland, for example. This would be a, a spot you could go to sample, but it, it's really tough to know where they are because, Again, they don't want to be found, and uh, nobody's really looking. Right. And so then just one last question, Robin. Uh, what feature do you look at to, or what is the first feature you would look at to identify Ixodes king eye adults? Well, I'd want to know, to confirm the genus, so that first thing I'd look at the anal groove, then I would know it's an Ixodes, and then the, the king eye, I believe they're they're quite... They're quite distinct in terms of the, the uh, I believe it's the, the scutum is quite distinct. I haven't looked at them in a while, but again, those are the, they are, I, I feel they're not hard to identify. Okay. So Robin, thank you for taking the time yet again out of your COVID chaos to uh, present for us. And thank you everybody else for joining us this week. The, um, I'm hopeful I'm not the only one whose uh, skin is crawling. But next week, we are going to have uh, one of our students actually presenting on the epidemiology of Campylobacter being carried by raccoons on swine farms and in different conservation areas in Ontario. So if you're interested at all in raccoons and their transmission of pathogens, next week is the week to join us. Thank you all again, and don't forget to stay safe and wash your hands. Have a great week. Yeah, thanks again. Thanks, Jasmine, for having me. Bye-bye. Anytime. Bye. Coolio. Harry? Are you still there?